not to us. Good morning, Trinity. Good morning, Trinity at high. The cross before me, the world behind, no turning back. Raise the banner high. It's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky. Let the people clap their hands and cry. It's not for us, it's all for you. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Shut burn for the world to see it's not for us it's all for you for you and not to us but to your name be the glory not to us but to your name be the glory the earth is shaking it's all for you. The waves are crashing, the sun is raging. It's all for you. The universe is spinning and singing. It's all for you. The children dancing, dancing, dancing. It's all for you. It's all for you. Us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Good morning. It is so good to see each of you here this morning. We are glad that you are here to worship with us. We want to welcome you this morning and welcome those online. And if you're a first-time visitor, we are glad that you are here also. And you can come see one of us. We can give you a, a rundown of Sunday school and all of that type stuff and child care. Uh, we'd be glad to, to help out with those. Just one announcement this morning, and that is our Rise Against Hunger. We know that we packed 21,600 meals, and we have about $7,600 of our $8,000 yeah, $8, goal. So we're just a couple hundred dollars away from finishing that. Uh, so if you haven't given, there's still time, uh, and then hopefully we'll be cutting the check to them this week. I think that's it for announcements, though. So let's go to God and invite him to be a part of our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this glorious morning, this springtime where we can walk out and see the sun shining and hear the birds chirping. We're reminded of, of new seasons and hope. Lord, we ask that you would come fill our service this morning, that you would fill each of us, that you would touch us in new ways, that we might be able to, to reach a community around us because you have kindled in us a new fire. We invite you to come this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing and worship Jesus this morning.
If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation, and still you know my heart. The author of salvation, you've loved me from the start. Waiting here for you with our heads lifted. Your faithfulness is true, and we're desperate for your presence. All we need is you. Desperate for your presence. All we need is you. you Maybe seated. Let's go to God in prayer again this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in expectation of you. That you would come and fill our time together this morning, that everything that we do would be pleasing to you. That you would feel our adoration and our praise. Lord, we give you thanks for the abundant grace that you have poured out on us over and over and over again. Your mercies are new every morning. For that we give you thanks. Lord, we know the world around us, there are still plenty that are hurting, that are sick, that are facing physical ailments that they're not sure that they can overcome. 
Lord, we know that those, there are those that are facing financial decisions. and They don't know what they're going to do next. Lord, we know those around us are facing the anxiety of so many different reasons. And so first this morning, Lord, we ask that you would give them peace. That they would feel you, that they would feel your touch, that you would wrap your arms around them and they would know that you are near. But also this morning, Lord, we call for you to heal them, to make them whole, to make them well again in whatever it is that they're facing. That you would give them clear answers and decisions that they're making. And that they would make decisions that are pleasing to you and you would be glorified in them and you would be glorified in their healing. That everyone would see them, but instead see you. Lord, we ask for the same thing for us this morning. That when people look at us, that they don't see us, but they see you. That there is something different, peculiar about us. In a world that is so desperately in need of your hope. Again, this morning, Lord, we call you to come. Come to this service, but come to this community, to this state and this nation. That your power would be seen abundantly over and over again. And no one can deny that it's you. Lord, we ask all of this in your precious name this morning. Amen. I want to ask our children uh, to come forward to go to Children's Church at this time. There was a nun a few years back who was a um, worked for a nursing service, an in-home nursing service, so she traveled from house to house. And on this particular day, um, she's kind of running late, and she runs out of gas. And so she walks down the street. She, you know, she's got to get to this patient's house, so she walks down the street to the gas station to ask them to borrow a can of gas so that she can get her car filled up and get to her appointment. Well, the man says, I'm so sorry, but, um, you know, I just lent out my only can. I'm, if you want to wait, I'm sure it'll come back here shortly. And she's, you know, she's thinking to herself, I, I can't wait. i got to get to this appointment. So she goes back to her car, and she begins looking through the car. And she finds a urinal in the car that she was going to give to this patient at the next appointment. And so she takes the urinal back to the gas station. She fills it up with gas. She comes back. And she's pouring it into the gas tank when she overhears two men walking by. And one says to the other, now that's faith. <laughs> and we need to think and consider where is our faith today. And as this passage of scripture in particular is in relation to where is our faith today. And, and do we believe in Jesus? Do we truly believe in him? Is there nothing that can happen in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis that would shake that faith? Do we hold firmly to him? If you would, please stand. We're going to, in, in honor of reading God's holy word, and we're reading John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It's the Lord. 
When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out of the, on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not, bro- was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was, not, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the gathered people of God. Please be seated. Um, you know, we have been looking at the seven signs of glory in the book of John. These signs that reveal the glory of Jesus, that reveal the person of Jesus, who he is, as well as what his character is. Um, his message for us. And let's review those. I've got a slide uh, uh, that that has them there. The first one is transformation of water into wine, where the Lord essentially is saying to folks, we're putting away empty ritual. Uh, What is most important, you're supposed to see what's um, the spirit of the law, and, and you're supposed to have a relationship. So instead of a ritual, I want a relationship, a delicious, full bodied, um, a nutritious um, relationship with you that gives you life. The second one, the healing of the son at Cana. Um, again, they're back in Cana, which we remember is a backwater town in Galilee. It's, it's a nowheresville, and yet Jesus does his first two miracles there. And he, and he came and he healed uh, the son of the um, leader from Capernaum. And so Jesus essentially lets us know that he's for everybody in the backwater, the small, the very little, all the way up to the officials and the very high. And he's come for everybody. The third one, the healing of a paralytic at Bethesda, where Jesus in Jerusalem heals this man who's been uh, crippled for 38 years. And this man um, isn't thankful. He doesn't say any word of thanks to Jesus. As a matter of fact, he turns him in and Jesus lets us know that he loves us and he's come and he's going to heal us regardless of how we respond. That his grace is extended to all of us, and even those that are ungrateful and uh, unresponsive. Then the next one is right in the middle. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's the one, the only miracle that's in all four of the Gospels. It is kind of the cornerstone of the Gospels. And Jesus, he lets us know that he is the bread of life. Um, And he feeds our deepest hungers. But unfortunately, the people kind of miss out. They don't understand. They don't realize Who he genuinely, well, they understand his power, but they don't really get um, how important he is. The next one is he's walking on the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus is the Lord of the universe, and he's coming across that sea for you and me. Um, He will do and he will go anywhere that's necessary to reach us, and in his power, he comes for each one of us. Then the healing of the blind man in Jerusalem, Jesus is the light of the world, and of course, this blind man understands his grace and his kindness that he's been extended, and he responds to him with great, great love and great gratefulness and thankful heart, um, and he turns to the Lord in tremendous faith. And then the last one is raising Lazarus from the dead, and Jesus defeated death so that we could believe, so that we could trust in him, and so he would set us up, really, and I've got it listed kind of as the eighth one that we're looking at today, but that was really the ninth one. The eighth one is um, the new beginnings. And that's when Jesus rises from the dead himself. And the number eight in the scriptures tends to reflect that that idea of new beginnings. And this is, of course, Jesus brings in the new covenant with his resurrection. But today's, um, this second abundant catch, it's not recorded in John, but it is recorded in the other gospels. Um, It's kind of like the epilogue sign or the encore sign where Jesus performs this last miracle in the book of John. Now remember, there's not a big crowd there. All that's there are these seven disciples. And so who's this miracle for? It's for the disciples themselves, and it's for you and me. 
so that we can see, so that this level of encouragement, this message is for you and I to understand. Let's look at the first two verses. After this, Jesus re- revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. All right, there are a lot of symbolic meanings in this um, eighth or really ninth sign, this epilogue or encore in the book of John. John is the only author in the scriptures that describes the Sea of Galilee this way. And John, who talks about it as the Sea of Tiberias. Now, one thing you need to know is that that Herod named the sea, it was always known as the Sea of Galilee, but he named it the Sea of Tiberias um, after, or that people talked about it that way, because Herod named that town of Tiberias after the emperor. And so it's, it's a reflection of the emperor of the Roman Empire. And John's the only one that uses this phrase to describe it. Now, in John chapter 6, he describes it, he says this, the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. But here in John 21, he goes straight to it, and he calls it just the Sea of Tiberias. Why is that? Because the sea represents the world. And, and of course, Tiberias being the emperor, the representative of the Roman world, which was the world of that day and that time. And so we need to see the Sea of Tiberias as representing the world itself. And the fish represent everybody in the world that's responsive to Jesus, that believe in him. And, of course, the book of John talks much about faith and believing. um, and, And those that believe are his disciples. The name and the sea represent the world, and the fish represent everybody in the world. Now, in John chapter 6, the crowd recognizes the power of Jesus, but they don't really want him. They don't want him to be the Lord of their lives. They they don't really want his control. What they want is what he can give them on a regular basis. They're attracted to the bread and the fish. Now, again, remember, what's going on here? Jesus is giving bread and fish to the disciples. He's at the Sea of Galilee. So it's also recalling their memory of him feeding the 5,000. So all this is connected, and we've got to see it um, right here. Um, Verse 2, let's look at those. Uh, The names in verse 2. We've got Simon Peter, of course, who's kind of the brash, bold guy uh, who has denied Jesus, and Jesus is about to reinstate him as a leader. And then Thomas, called the twin, and he's just, in chapter 20, we've been talking about him where he's got all these doubts, and he says he won't believe until he sees Jesus and puts his finger um, in the mark, and he's listed as number two right here. Then Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, again, recalling Cana, um, and that's where Nathaniel is from. So Nathaniel, Jesus described him as a pure-hearted man who was honest in every way from a backwater town. And so that's being recalled to our minds as well. And then the sons of Zebedee, John is putting himself in the background. He doesn't name himself or his brother. And then two others of the disciples were there together. And so these two others most likely were Philip um, and Andrew. Philip is a good friend of Nathaniel. He's the one that introduced Nathaniel to Jesus. Andrew is Peter's brother. They're fishermen. They're from this area. Most likely it's those seven. But why does John not name Philip and Andrew, or whoever these two disciples are. Again, now, there are seven of them. And what does that represent? Seven is the number of perfection. It's God's number. It's also the number that represents the church. In the, the book of Revelation, we have the seven churches. And so John is, is helping us understand that this is the church. And he's named some folks. He's named Peter, this brash guy who's blown it. He's named Thomas, who has doubted. Um, But he's also named Nathaniel or Bartholomew, this guy of integrity and honesty and straightforwardness. And he's named the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, who also tend to blow it. But then he's got this vague idea of two people in the background. Why? Because the body of Christ is all of us. And and those two two vague ones are, are you and me. And we're a part of this church, and we're, we're supposed to be fishing for men. We're supposed to be going out there 
and fishing for men and women who don't know the Savior. All right. Um, The first point that I want to make this morning is this. When we're discouraged, we tend to turn to what makes us feel good. When we're discouraged, we tend to turn to what makes us feel good. All right. Let's look at the first part of verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat. All right. Um, When we're discouraged, we're usually vulnerable to our weaknesses. And usually our weaknesses are related to our wounds and disappointments in life. Um, And, of course, Peter and the disciples um, are wounded right now, and they are disappointed. They're disappointed that Jesus died. They're excited that he's been raised from the dead, uh, but Peter especially is very disappointed. And we know at the end of this chapter that Jesus reinstates him as a leader in the church. But they're also disappointed. They're disappointed in themselves. They know that they didn't stand with Jesus in his greatest need, and they're feeling down. And because of that, they want to feel better. And so what do they do? They go to something they know that they're good at. They go to their old way of making a living. um, And and they move on in that way. Pain and disappointment tend to make us believe lies about ourselves, about how God feels about us. And pain and disappointment can also make us believe lies about what God is like. We can begin to think that God is very cold and that he demands performance on our part and that salvation is ultimately by works. That's why literally every single other religion in the world is based on works. Um, and yet, that's not the way the Lord is. And he understands that the only way for us is through a free gift. The only way for us is through his empowerment through his spirit. The only way for us is for us to humbly receive that gift and to admit it that we need him and and that we rely upon him, that we trust him. That's why belief is such a big deal um, in this particular gospel. We don't want to believe the lies um, that we develop in our hearts and minds about the way God is and about what we're like. Now, we don't tend to want to think about these things. We don't want to think about these disappointments or these wounds that we've experienced in life that have now shaped our thinking about who we are and who God is and what God is like. And yet those things are important for us to understand and for us to get a grip on. Um, There was a pro golfer here in the last few years who was fairly pompous and ego-centered, and he, whenever he was on... uh, the, uh, the course, if, if he had a bad day, he blamed it on something or somebody or the weather or, or the course or his caddy, whatever it was. He always had an excuse for when he did poorly. But he also wasn't beyond um, playing games with amateurs uh, for like $50 a hole or something like that. And so he would take advantage of people on a regular basis. Well, one day, this man came up to him with real dark glasses on and a white cane, capping, and he's blind. And he says, "Um, I hear you play with folks. I'd love to play a game with you for $100 a hole. And the man goes, $100 a hole? I mean, that's a lot of money. You're blind, aren't you? And he goes, yes, I'm blind, but, but as a young man, I was state champion, and so I think I can take you. And the man goes, he you know, shakes his head, he thinks for a minute, he says, okay, I'll do it, but you're going to lose a lot of money, I'm going to beat you bad. And then he turns to the blind man and he goes, what time do you want to play? And the blind man turns back to him and he says, any time at night you want, any time at night you want. You know, we tend to put our hope and our trust in things that are shakable. We tend to go back to the things that make us comfortable. And we don't ultimately put our faith and our hope and our trust in the one that we know is unshakable and that we can trust. And unfortunately, we get a very distorted picture sometimes in our minds because of things that happen to us. Sometimes they were out of our control. Sometimes they happened when we were young. Sometimes they happened in our families. 
Sometimes it happened in middle school or high school, one of the most vulnerable periods in our lives, when people will say things about us and to us that are not true, and yet they wound us deeply, and it can alter the course of our lives if we're not careful, and if we don't come back to what we know to be true. The truth of the matter is that you're created in the image of God, and that, that as a sinner, yes, we have been offered the greatest gift that there is, that Jesus has literally come for you, and he would come for you if you were the only lost sheep, and he died on the cross to forgive you of your sin, but also to heal you of your deepest wounds and disappointments. And that's one of the things that Jesus was doing with his disciples on this day. They were getting healed from some deep wounds and some deep disappointments. All right, but what are those? We don't know for sure. We know that Peter really blew it. We know that they abandoned him, um, Jesus, everybody but John. John's the only one that went and, and watched at the cross. He's the only one that went to his trial. But one of the things that we do know is this. All right, I'm going to share with you some information about what it means to be a disciple during the days of Jesus, during the New Testament times. A young Jewish boy um, would, between the ages of 5 and 10, would go into a school that's called Beth Sephar, Beth Sephar, B-E-T-S-E-F-E-R, Beth Sephar. And they would go from 5 to about 10 years of age, and they would study the Pentateuch, the Torah, the, the, the Scriptures, the first five books of the Scriptures. And then the next school, um, after that age, you know, about 11 to um, 14, they would go to what's called Beth Midrash. And Beth Midrash was kind of like the high school of Scripture study. Now, the young ladies would study the Psalms um, and, and Proverbs, and they would memorize those. And uh, again, these young boys are memorizing the Pentateuch. Now they're moving to the Beth, Beth Midrash, which is the rest of the scriptures. And then the very brightest of the brightest, the best of the best, at around 15 to 20 years of age, would begin to um, go after a rabbi. And they would try out to be a, a disciple, a Talmud of a rabbi. And the best of the best, the, the ones that go to Harvard and Yale, that kind of young person would become a, a disciple, a Talmud of a rabbi. And then by 20, you've got a trade, and you're living in that trade. Well, all of Jesus, and, and, and like, remember what I said, you try out to be a disciple. Jesus does things absolutely backwards as a rabbi. Jesus doesn't have disciples come and try out. Jesus goes and picks who he wants. And he went and picked Peter and Andrew and James and John. He went and found them. But what were they doing? They already had a trade. They were already fishing. They were already doing other jobs. In other words, they were not the best of the best. They were not the Harvards and the Yales. They were already the, the lower rung folks. And so Jesus picked them not because they were the smartest people around, but because he believed in the end, he trusted that they would trust him. That in the end, they would believe in him and that they would trust him for their salvation and that they would ultimately know how to give that grace away to other people. And for that reason, Jesus picked them. And now on this day, he's thinking, I'm not the best of the best. I've blown it again. I'm not making it. So I'm going fishing. I'm a good fisherman. I know how to do that. I'm not a good Talmud. I'm not a very good disciple. And I have blown it. And I want to feel good about myself. And so I'm going to go do something I know I'm good at. And so Peter decides he's going to go fishing that day. And he takes along the others with him. Jesus didn't pick him because he was the best, though. He didn't pick him because he was the most holy. He didn't pick him because he was the smartest. He picked him because he believed in the end Peter would trust in the, the grace and the, the goodness and the love of Jesus rather than his own goodness. The second point I want to share is this. Decisions based on discouragement leave us empty. Decisions based on discouragement leave us empty. The last part of 3 through verse 5 reads this way. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. 
Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. So Peter and uh, the other disciples, they want to feel better about themselves, so uh, they feel bad about being Talmese. They don't feel like they're the best of the best. They feel like they've blown it, and so they want to go do something they think they're good at. And so they go off fishing. But they go fishing without Jesus. They go fishing on their own. They go fishing, um, uh, and, and unfortunately, they're dependent upon their own strength. You know, whatever our weakness is, it may be a, our besetting sin. It may be something that's persistent that we seem to struggle with on a consistent basis. And it, and it seems like it's never going to leave us, but, but it always leaves us feeling empty when we fall to it. Peter and the disciples give up on God's best for them, and they think that the best that they can do is fish. In other words, they settle for second best. But you may not be called to, to full-time ministry. You may be thinking, oh, well, what does this have to do with me, Steve? I mean, I've I'm, I'm not been called to be a full-time uh, minister. But the truth of the matter is every single one of us is a disciple. Every single one of us is called to have a ministry. Every single one of us is supposed to minister within the body of Christ and outside of the body of Christ. Every single one of us is called to share the gospel wherever we go, and, and it's supposed to, to flavor and change and, and kind of infect everything that we do and all of the work that we do. And what the disciples are doing, uh, they're trying to do their work. They're trying to fish their way in their own strength and not in consistent consistency with the will of God for them. They're doing things their way in their own efforts. It's all about them. Do you remember what the one thing the disciples always argued about? It's really the only thing that they ever argued about. Who's the best disciple? And so pride is the thing that they have fallen to, and they think it's all about them. They think, I've got to be the best of the best. I've got to be that top rung. I've got to make it that way. And without that, I don't have value. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus looks at you and me, and he says, you're my son, you're my daughter. I made you my image, and I want you because you're created like me, and I love you, and I've come for you, and I want to make you into something that's really special. I want to make you into the person that you're created to be. Have you ever given your work, your direction, and ultimately your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Because that's what we're talking about here. That's what the disciples had to, to really come to. And they had, even when it comes to discouragement, even when it comes to pain, even when it comes to tragedy, are they going to allow the Lord uh, to be Lord of their lives? The third point I want to share is this. Jesus, or God, provides healing and abundance in our life, work, and ministry. He, he provides healing, abundance in our life, work, and ministry in all three of those areas. Now look with me to verses 6 through 11. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul, um, to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It's the Lord. When, Peter, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came to the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. All right. Uh, what we've got to understand here is um, a number of things, but, but Jesus then it gets on board. You know, it's one thing to go fishing without Jesus. One thing to go to our life without him being the Lord, is, without him being the one that's guiding. But when he gets involved, then you know things are going to go the right way. 
Now, you might not always get a miraculous catch, but when you trust him and when you give your work to him and when you give your life to him, you can be confident that he's going to ultimately cause it to flourish, that you're going to be abundant in the way that you live, that he's going to have more than what you need. He's going to give you success because he wants to. He wants to bless us. He wants to bless us so that we can bless other people. He wants us to be a blessing to other people. All right, now, you may be thinking to yourself a number of things. For one, Peter didn't pull the net in by himself. By himself. What it means is he led the others because, remember, they can't even pull it in, all of them, six of them, by themselves. So seven of them go out there and they pull the net up on shore. Um, one of the things that you've got to remember is uh, how was G Peter called to ministry? Peter, James, and John, Andrew, how were they called to ministry? When you go back to the book of Luke in chapter 5, that's the first abundant catch. And Peter and John and Andrew and Luke, uh, John and James are out there. They're mending their nets. They're getting things cleaned up. And Jesus preaches from one of the boats for a period of time. And then he turns to Peter and he says, go out a little bit and throw out your net one more time. And Peter says, Master, <laughs> we fished all night long and we haven't caught a single fish. But because you say it, we'll do it. And so they go out a little bit further and they throw out their net. And when they do, they catch the catch of catches, just like they did on this particular day on the Sea of Galilee. Except this time uh, in Luke, uh, they catch so many fish that they call their buddies, James and John, over to help them. And so now they've got four people trying to get all the fish in. But as they get the fish in, they get so many fish in that the, the net starts to break, and the boat starts to then sink. And ultimately, they fill two boats full of fish. Um, and, and at the end, Peter turns and understands who Jesus is. And they follow him, and that's the day that Jesus called them to be disciples. But on this day, he's calling them back because they've had a failure. They're discouraged, and they need to know that the Lord's still with them. 153 fish. What in the world is that? It, it, it's hard to know. There's lots of debate over it. There are some scholars that believe that, that 153 was the number of types of fish in the world at that time. And because of that, that's the number. And that's why God had 150 of these large fish. Um, others just say it, it's a big number. And, and because of that, they wanted everybody to know that it was a huge number. But 153 fish represent the people that will respond to Jesus by faith. And, and they're called and know that Jesus is going to give them the success that they need. If they'll trust him, if they'll allow him to be the one that guides and directs their decisions, if, he, if they allow him to be the one that's Lord of their lives. You know, in the beginning, Peter knew that he was a sinful man and that the grace of God was the only way for him to make it. But at this point, um, he's turned to his own strength for hope. Our passage uh, John 21, uh, verses 12 through 13 says this, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. Now, remember, this is also supposed to remind us of that great feeding of the 5,000, where he does exactly the same thing. He shares with them the bread and then the fish. And it's supposed to bring to their memory that experience and to know that that's the God that's on their side. And that if they'll trust him, he'll see them all the way through. But what did Jesus say at that time? Uh, in John chapter 6, after feeding the 5,000, he said, Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. God wants to bring a blessing to our lives. He wants to meet our deepest hungers and our deepest thirst. In John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, we've talked about this a number of times during this series. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life 
in his name. John is really the only book that's written to non-believers. Why is it written? So that you may believe. So that you may believe that, that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Son of God, and that believing uh, you may have life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's the reason that Jesus has come. He wants to bless our lives. He wants to give us the strength that we need. When we put our trust in Christ, discouragement won't de derail us. We stop believing lies about ourselves. We stop believing lies about the Lord. And we can experience the abundant healing that he wants for each one of us. I want to close with a story about a man, um, and, and I can't really, I'm going to give one shot to his first name. His name is um, uh, Bigniu, 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 but his last name is Stai Polkowski, Stai Polkowski. Um, Mr. Stai Polkowski was in the Polish underground during World War II, and uh, during World War II, while they were occupied by the Germans, the Polish developed a government that was underground. And Cy Polkowski was part of that, and he fought against the Germans, against the Nazis. But towards the end of the war, when Russia came in and took over Poland, the Russians then turned on that underground government because they wanted to dominate Poland. And so they arrested Cy Polkowski and 15 others. It was called the Trial of the Sixteen. And they took him back to Russia, and they, they put him on trial in Russia. And they tortured these 16 men. Um, and they did it for uh, 141 interrogations, Stai Polkowski. Uh, for over 70 days, he was tortured. Um, and it was relentless. And it was just terrible, physical and emotional and mental and spiritual torture. They, they had been working for the underground. They hadn't ever done anything wrong. They had been on the good guy's side the whole time. And, and so they had to break them emotionally and mentally in order to make them confess to these things that they wanted uh, to accuse them of because they wanted to crush that government. And they did not want it to thrive. They didn't want an underground government fighting against them. And so all 15 of the 16 uh, ultimately confessed. The only one that didn't was Stipolkowski. And Stipolkowski was a devout Christian man. And because of that, he consistently, every day, spent time with the Lord in prayer, even when he was being tortured. He, his tortures were so brutal that one of the interrogators eventually had a mental breakdown and had to quit and be replaced with another interrogator. It was a terrible, terrible experience. But ultimately, because the Western world was there watching the trial... And because he never would admit to doing wrong, he said, I, I've never been dishonest. I have never in any way betrayed my country. I will not admit to anything that I haven't done. And so he continued to do that. And ev eventually they had to let him go. And what he said was this. He said, when they showed me I was a coward, I already knew it. When they shook their fingers at me with accusations of filthy, lewd feelings, I already knew it. When they showed me a reflection of myself with all my inadequacies, I said to them, But gentlemen, I am much worse than that. For you see, I had learned it was unnecessary for me to justify myself. One had already done that for me, Jesus Christ. And he said that, that he had taken him, his life to the foot of the cross and he had trusted the Lord for all that he was and all that he had done wrong. And because of that, he could be absolutely honest about who he was and never worry about what people would accuse him of. And he could stand steady. That's the kind of faith that the Lord's calling us to have. He wants us to know that he genuinely has loved us. He's loved us so much that he bled his life out for us. He gave himself up for us to rescue us, to give us abundant life, to heal our deepest wounds and disappointments, but also to give us the courage and the boldness and the courage to be able to share that truth with other people, to help them know that they're loved and that they're, 
they're, uh, they're cherished by God himself, that they're precious in his sight, and that God wants the best for them, and he wants to bring healing for them. That's what you and I are called to, to be that kind of disciple. And that's why Jesus cooked fish and bread breakfast for the disciples that day. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we bow before you this day, and we thank you for your love for us, and we thank you for the fact that the disciples we know left everything. In other words, they allowed you to be Lord of all of their lives, that they gave all the opportunities and the resources that they had to, to you, to your disposal, so that you would guide and direct them. And then they followed you as disciples. Father, I pray that you'd help us each to determine today that we'll do exactly the same thing, that we will turn over all of our resources, all that we have, all that we are, all of our gifts and abilities, and that we will follow you as Talmud, as disciples, and that we will allow you to guide and direct our decisions, our thoughts, and the way in which we live our lives, that it would be lives of great gratitude and thanksgiving in reflection of what you've done for us thank you for loving us so perfectly and father if there's anybody who's never embraced jesus as their savior i ask that you'd help them that your spirit would give them all that they need right now to make that decision to turn over uh, the things that they have and possess to you but more importantly to believe in you and to begin to trust you enough to follow you for the rest of their lives. I ask that you'd help them to pray these simple words. To say, Lord, I need you. I do trust you. I know that the, the, the best place I can give my decisions, my career, my future, is to give it to you. And so I give you my life. And I ask that you would guide and direct me. And I commit now to follow you as a disciple, as a Talmud. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the life that you give us through this faith. Thank you for your grace that covers all of our failures, all of our hurts, all of the tragedy we may have experienced, and ultimately gives us strength to love like Jesus has loved us. In his name we pray, amen. Um, we're going to continue to worship the Lord. Uh, we won't be taking up an offering still, of course. Um, if you're online, you can do it electronically or you can do so in the narthex. As you're able, please stand and let's continue to worship God in song. Living, dying, let me pray 
my strength, my solace from this spring. That he who lives to be my king. Once died to be my savior. That he would leave his place on high. And come for sinful men to die. You count it strange, so once did I. Before I knew my Savior, my Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. skilled to understand what God has will, what God has planned. I only know in His right hand stands one who is my Savior. It's interesting that Peter, the one who denied knowing Jesus, ever knowing him or following him, did not recognize Jesus on the shore, isn't it? He had seen a miraculous catch before, and yet he didn't realize Jesus was there. And John, his good buddy, was the one that had to point it out to him. But once he did, once he tasted again of the bread of life of the person of Jesus... Once Peter humbled himself before the love of God again, he was never the same. He went forth with great boldness, filled with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And he proclaimed Jesus for the rest of his life. Whenever we've failed, whenever we've not recognized Jesus in our lives, we need to know his grace is extended to us. He loves us, and he is feeding us again that bread of life. Be filled and go in its strength and the power of his spirit. Amen. The cross before me, the world behind. No turning back, raise the banner high. It's not for me. It's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky. Let the people clap their hands and cry. It's not for us. It's all for you. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us. Glory. Our hearts unfold before your throne, the only place for those who know it's not for us, it's all for you. Send your holy fire on this offering. Let our worship bird for the world to see. It's not for us, it's all for you. For you, and not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. The earth is shaking. It's all for you. The waves are crashing, the sun is raging. It's 
is all for you. The universe is spinning and singing. It's all for you. The children dancing, dancing, dancing. It's all for you. It's all for you. To your name be the glory. Have a great day, Trinity Online.